Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Glad you could join us today. Welcome to BST Live, the show for systematic and algorithmic traders. Today, we're going to be talking about innovation with Dr. Brett Steinbarger. So let's get to it. Well, welcome. Glad you could join us today. I've uh, had a few weeks off because, as you can probably tell, I've moved house. The background is very different. Fingers crossed the internet connection runs well today. It's the, the first show. So um, uh, fingers crossed, everyone, please. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. So today um, we've got a very special guest. I've been really looking forward to this one. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about innovation in trading. And our special guest, actually, I already said the name, I think, so it's probably a, a not, not such a surprise, but he's a trader, he's an author, and he's a trading coach. He has actually been on the show before. I think um, it was September 2015, so six years ago, but it's great to have you back. G'day, Brett. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. So I'm the first one in the new house. You are the first one in the new house. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I, I'm honoured. Thank you. Excellent. So um, now uh, I just mentioned, obviously, that you're a trader and a, um, a coach and an author. You've published a couple of fantastic books, and I'm going to be talking about some of the stuff on your um, your website, your blogs today. But perhaps um, just for people who are, are maybe new, can you just give us a quick little background on yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I'm a psychologist. You know, that's that's my main work. I teach at a medical school in Syracuse, New York, and have done so since 1985. So I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh, Andrew. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So since 1985, but I've been trading actually since the late 1970s. So uh, yeah, yeah, I go back yep. a while. And you know, I always joke with people that my real expertise doesn't come from my PhD. My real expertise is I've been trading so long that I've made every single mistake <laughs> that possibly could be made in trading and hopefully have learned a little bit from it. Uh, but I, I trade uh, mostly right, uh, the stock indexes and I trade on a short time frame. Most of my trades are intraday. And uh, I use uh, some back testing to identify promising ideas. Mm -hmm. So that fits with your BST theme. Yes. Your BST, I'm just BS, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what can I tell you, dude? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, anyway, but I work, my primary work, even though I teach in a medical school, my primary work is as a trading coach for uh, professional traders. I work with hedge funds, proprietary trading firms, investment banks, and I help them with their performance. And sometimes that means helping them with their trading. Sometimes it means helping them with their psychology. Yeah, excellent. So I'm going to be asking you a little bit about that today because um, sure. obviously the, the topic is innovation. I know you've, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you speak with uh, you do um, sorry coaching with uh, hedge funds and prop trading firms and you know institutional side. So uh, you're very well um, experienced in this area of I guess seeing what makes those type of traders um, successful over the long term. And it's something I've noticed um, you know on your website and your blog is you, you do have um, some interesting approaches. You you obviously innovation and creativity is important to you personally. But what about in, in the broader trading arena? What do you notice about the, uh, the impact or role of innovation in you know, the work that you do? Yeah, um, you know, there are two levels of improvement that we can make. One is playing the game better. Mm. The other is playing a better game. And what I find with the traders I work with who are particularly successful is that to a large degree, they're playing a better game. They're doing something unique. Right. Yeah, I'll just step back for a moment and uh, take a more philosophical perspective. <laughs> you know, back in the day, so I'll share a little history. So back in the day mm -hmm. when I was a sophomore in college, at Duke University, where I majored in basketball, um, um, I ended up reading a novel 
from a philosopher novelist. It was called The Fountainhead. Her name is Ayn Rand. Yep. And it really struck me because it presented a heroic conception of people and, and what we can become. Life is too short to be me too. There are many people in the trading world who are me too. They're trading the same ideas. They're trading the same setups and patterns as everyone else. And sure enough, they don't achieve distinguished results. Mm. Distinguished results never come from being part of the herd. <laughs> and so, yes, it's great to play the game better. But when we innovate, to some degree, we're playing a different game. We're doing something different from others. And if you look at successful entrepreneurs, if you look at successful people in the arts and sciences, they haven't just done the same thing better. They've done unique things. And so part of my work in helping traders is to help them find the talents and the insights that they have that are truly unique. Mm, yeah. So I guess there's um, perhaps there's a process around that which um, we can uh, dig into in a moment. But why do you think, um, you know, when we were talking about the topic uh, that we were going to discuss today uh, beforehand, and I, I mentioned to you that, you know, I had um, a couple of guests in the in the past week or couple, of, oh, sorry, month or a couple of months that, that kind of, um, you know, they shared new ideas and new concepts about position sizing. And I literally got some messages from traders saying, I've never heard of this before. It sounds like a scam. And, you know, they immediately, they immediately shut it down. And, you know, that's not all traders, obviously, but that, that was a, se a section. Why do you think um, traders, it, it's almost like sometimes they, 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 um, they dismiss innovation either, you know, actively or maybe subconsciously. But why do you think traders are like that? Is there some kind of um, thing where traders are afraid to change or what's actually driving that, uh, that behaviour? Yeah, it's a great question. Change is uncomfortable. You know, yeah. if we stay in our comfort zone, by definition, we're not changing. And so if something really is unique, if it's different, it's going to make us uncomfortable at the beginning. And that's not a negative thing. That's a positive, but it's not easy. And so sometimes I hear new things, different things that challenge what I do. Uh, that happened to me early in my development as a trader. Hmm. I had been pursuing trading for a number of years, and it was around the year 2000 that I ended up meeting with a very famous trader named Victor Niederhofer. You might be familiar with his book, Education yep. of a Speculator. And uh, Victor was a, a wonderful mentor to me and, and brought me into his office and I saw what he was doing, and all of his ideas were back tested. All of his ideas had been studied scientifically, mathematically. And I had never done anything like that. And at first I was uncomfortable, but then I realized that there was something there and um, ended up learning from that. And I think that's usually the case that. Uh, as you know, back when I was a graduate student, I uh, went into therapy myself because I wanted to experience what it's like to be on the other side when you're meeting with a therapist. And I had a great experience, actually. And my therapist said something to me that, that stuck with me all these years. Whenever you feel anxious, whenever you feel uncomfortable, pursue your anxiety. Mm -hmm. because that's where your growth lies, because that's where you're uncomfortable. That's what pushes you beyond your comfort zone. And so uh, I've tried to do that myself as a trader, and I try to do that with the people I work with. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So you've uh, you've kind of just uh, given us perhaps a little bit of an inkling into what um, yeah there might be a process to for traders to follow to be more innovative. Have you found that there is a process or some steps that traders can follow to uh, apply more innovation into their research and their trading? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll respond in two different ways. Sure. There, there's, a, there's a tradition in what's called positive psychology that tells us that we best learn from our successful experiences. That when we are successful, when we do something really well, that tells us something about our strengths. For many years as a trader, I really wanted to be a longer time frame trader. Well, actually, I didn't want to be a trader. I wanted to be a longer time frame <laughs> investor. And I thought that I should be like a hedge fund guy, you know? Yep. Yeah. And that's not where my talents were. I was good at pattern recognition and short term trading. My, when I looked at my successful trades, the average holding time was 20 minutes. And so, in terms of innovating, sometimes we can innovate simply by looking at what we do well and not trying to be what we think we should be, mm. but rather to take a look at what we genuinely do well. So that's why I tell the people I work with, study, 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 study your winning trades. You know, everyone focuses, they write in their journal, and you know what people write in their journal. You know, I messed this up, and you know, I missed this trade, and you know, they, they talk about all the things they did wrong. And, and of course, we want to improve our mistakes. What did you do right? What are your strengths? What you know, what were your really good trades? Uh, my blog, Trader Feed, uh, this uh, my most recent entry, I posted one of my very successful trades. And you know, it's not to boast or anything like that. It's to say, this is who I am. This is what I do well. And we innovate in part by being more of who we actually are. Hmm. Now, for me, the second part of innovation is what I mentioned with respect to um, the influence of Victor Niederhofer, that uh, I personally don't find for myself, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be. It's okay. <laughs> you know, people look at chart patterns and for the life of me, I can't figure out why a shape on a chart should be predictive of world financial markets and conditions. I think there's a lot of randomness to that. And yes, there is some value in, in quote unquote technical analysis. And I do find charts use, useful as frames of reference, but people are too quick to look for trades. They want to find quote unquote setups or they want to find macro stories that will put them into a trade. Mm. In my case, just speaking personally about my development as a trader, Part of my innovation came when I realized I don't have to trade. <laughs> 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 that I can sit and I can sit and I can sit and I can wait for there to be a distinctive edge in my trading. And then I can size it up and you know, make some money. And then I can go back to actually having a life, <laughs> not sitting in front of screens. Too many traders are looking for setups. They're looking to trade. They need to trade. Anything you need, Andrew, controls you. Mm. If I need approval from other people, other people control me. Right. 
You know, the Andrew Dice Clay nursery rhyme, little boy blue, he, he needed the money. Anyway. <laughs> um, um, you know, when we need something, we become desperate. It controls us. And so for me, part of innovation was to not need to trade. I've got five mm. kids. I've got a career as a psychologist. I've got seven grandkids. I've got four rescue cats. You know, I, you know I've got a full life. You know, do I need to trade? No. But that frees me up to sit and sit and sit and wait for when the odds are in my favor. And so that has become a style of trading for me that has been an innovation, that has been successful. And it's based on knowing some odds. Okay, so now I'll tell you some odds. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, for the, for the listeners, yeah, we yeah. got to. We got to help the listeners here. Okay, so, you know, we had a strong day on Friday, didn't we, in, in the U.S. stock market. Uh, got a good rally, and I posted about that, uh, my trade on that. Now I'll start to comment. So sure. You know what bugs me about people who talk about trading psychology? They never talk about trading. <laughs> like, they give all this kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, they talk about, like, <laughs> follow your plan. What the fuck? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> they never talk about markets. If you're a trader, you talk about markets. Anyway, don't get me started. Uh, you're not. The <laughs> diplomatic uh, stance is out the window now, isn't it? It's gone. <laughs> yeah, we're not mentioning names, all right? Yeah, no. yeah, because otherwise you get to maybe you lose a nice new place. Um, anyway, anyway. Yeah, so I posted on Trader Feed um, my trade for Friday's uh, market because that was a trade where the odds were definitely in the favor. We were oversold on a short-term basis, and uh, there was a statistical study that I uh, conducted that showed we had an upside edge. We opened strong and continued strong. And then I explain in my post, it's traderfeed.blogspot.com. I explain in my post how I took advantage of that. It was one of my better trades of the year, actually. Uh, okay, so now the market's already gone up. So what do we do now? Well, it turns out, um, and by the way, there's a, there's a really nice website. And, and you know, whenever I mention a website, it's not because I get any compensation for that. Um, it's because I, I personally find it useful. Um, the uh, site is called marketcharts.com. And what's really interesting, and, and I, are you familiar with that, Andrew? Yes, I am. Yep. Oh, good. Good. Okay. Yeah. So what's, what's really nice about that is that you can actually back test patterns in the market without knowing programming, without, without doing the programming yourself. Hmm. which is very helpful for some traders who are uh, like old guys like me. Anyway, <laughs> so, all right. So what happened on Friday? We rallied and the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 universe. So take all 500 stocks and we take their 10 day RSI. So you're familiar with the RSI, yes. the Relative Strength Index. It's a technical indicator. The 10-day RSI, we're looking at how many of the stocks, individual stocks within the S&P 500 universe, crossed above 50%, uh, an RSI of 50. Okay, so we're looking at how many stocks in the S&P universe crossed into positive territory on the RSI. Yeah. And it turned out that uh, we had a nice crossover on Friday. So what has happened over the past two years you know, during this, basically this COVID period, when we have been oversold and then cross above that level? Okay, so we have 
more than 50% of stocks trading uh, their uh, 10-day RSI uh, above 50. And what we find is that nine, there have been 19 occasions where that's occurred. 17 have been up and two have been down. Mm. And the average gain over a five-day period has been 1.67%. Hmm. Okay. Now, is that proof? Do we automatically trade that? No, of course not. We have to see if price action confirms that record, that track record. Now, interestingly, that signal did not fire for the S&P 600 small cap stocks. So I am watching carefully divergences in the market. We're showing some strength in the large caps. Mm. Some small caps are not firing. So that's something I am processing in real time. And that, for me, has been an innovation where we look at the breadth of the market. How many stocks show strength Mm -hmm. within an index? How many show weakness? And what tends to happen going forward when we have lots of stocks showing strength or lots of stocks showing weakness? And that marketcharts.com site is just one way that we can take a look at that information. But you're using a back test <clears throat> to figure out where might there be an edge. Mm. And then you're looking to price action to see, are we confirming that edge? And that tells you there might be a trade. When there's not an edge, when the price action doesn't confirm, what do you do? Nothing. <laughs> not <laughs> a thing. Thing. <laughs> the edge comes from not needing to trade. The innovation mm-hmm. comes from only trading when you have the advantage. And you know what that's like? It's like playing poker. When you draw a hand in poker and you've got a bunch of different cards unsuited, what do you do? You muck the hand, you throw it down, and you don't bet. Hmm. And part of your edge as a poker player is knowing what the odds are and betting when the odds are in your favor. It's no different in the market. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I've got so many questions out of that uh, that piece there. But um, one thing I really got from what you were saying there, which is, um, uh, you know, you when you have an idea, uh, you need to prove it somehow, whether it's through backtesting or you can do it by hand, I guess, if you're not a programmer or the website that, that you mentioned. But um, how do you actually come up with the ideas in the first place? Like you mentioned that that, that um, market watch um, website, but what about, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the internet and there's books and there's podcasts like mine. Um, you know, how do you come up with something yourself that you want to actually test? That's a great question. And because I'm not the most complicated human being in the world, I only look at two sources of edge. This right. is actually serious. Like, like, I don't look at news articles and commentary from people. I'm really not looking to trade. There are only two edges that interest me. One is called momentum. Momentum means a strong market continues strong. A weak market continues weak. So one of the edges I look for is momentum. The other edge is reversal. A strong market tends to reverse. A weak market tends to bounce. And I will back test. I will use market history to tell me if there's an edge in terms of momentum or in terms of reversal. Um, I only use market history that is relevant to the current period. So for example, I don't go back so many years in back testing 
that I would include some bear market period like 2008. It's not relevant to today. Mm. Yeah. It's a different set of conditions. In my recent back tests, I used the last couple of years because that's basically the COVID period, period leading up to COVID and, and so forth. Yeah. And, and I found that to be useful. And I'm looking for evidence of momentum. I'm looking for evidence of reversal. And those are the two edges I look for. If I look for too many things, then I'm going to find the one in 20 things that are statistically significant at the 0.05 level by chance. In other words, if you look for enough things, you'll find something that looks significant. I would rather limit my search to what I understand, what is meaningful to me, and see if there's a distinctive edge there. In the case of Friday's market, where we went from over uh, short-term oversold to uh, you know to a nice rally, and we're a little bit in overbought territory, there does tend to be historically some forward uh, momentum. Uh, and so that is a trade I'm considering, but I'm concerned that that signal did not fire for the small caps. And so I, I'm being circumspect about taking that idea. That's a nice example of using market history and market patterns to help frame our ideas. Mm, yeah. So when you... <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So when you think about trading, there's there's a lot of different aspects to it, right? So we've been talking a little bit about entries and, and market environments, but you've got you know stock management, trade management, position sizing, a whole whole lot of you know a, a lot of different aspects to trading. Do you think that there are certain areas of trading that are more more um, or are better for innovation, or um, some that are that are kind of leading behind or going forward? You know, what's your thoughts about? Uh, innovation in particular aspects of trading? Yeah, another good question, Andrew. And, and what I mentioned in my blog is that when you have a back tested edge and then you see price action confirming that edge, that's where you want to become more aggressive and you can size up positions and make some good money. So you are using position sizing to express what you are seeing in markets. Mm -hmm. You have a historical edge, and now the price behavior of what you're trading is supporting that edge. And as long as that's the case, you can afford to size up. You can afford to take more risk. Now, in the example I gave with respect to Friday's trade, there was an upside edge and we opened strong. And so I was able, once the market moved my way, I was able to set a stop level at basically at the market open, basically at the point where I had entered to create good risk reward. Mm. Innovation is not just about what I call the idea of the trade. It's about how we structure the trade. I'm not concerned with getting in at the absolute lows or selling the absolute highs. I'm concerned with finding inflection points that give me superior reward relative to risk. So if I show a historical upside edge, and then we start to move higher, I will take the most recent low and set my stop there. Because if that edge plays out and the trend is truly higher, we should not revisit that recent low. So I think we can innovate not only in our trading ideas, but in how we manage our trades. Mm, yep. Um, we've got a very interesting question here in the chat. I just want to post it up here. It's a two-parter, so I'll, um, I'll read it to you. One minute. I'll get it up on the screen. It's from Matt. Thanks for the question, Matt. Um, let me just make sure I get these parts the right order. Okay, so this one is first. Should come up on the screen. 
Uh, Michael has talked a lot about the skill luck split. For example, in an endeavor, 55% of outcomes are driven by skill with the remainder being luck or randomness. The second part, here we go up on the screen. In your opinion, what percentage of trading outcomes can be attributed to skill and or luck and randomness? It's a great question. I wish I could give a precise percentage. Um, clearly, there. Clearly, this is a probabilistic game, Andrew. Mm. That we are looking to put probabilities on our side. If I do a historical study and I find that there are twenty-five instances of something occurring in the market, and twenty are up or five are down, okay, the odds may be in my favor if I rely on market history. But in fact, it could be one of those five down where you know, we lose money. And, and so um, we want to be able to survive the possibility of those odds going against us. In term, and, and that's part of the whole luck versus skill. The skill is in putting the probabilities in our favor. The luck is having the probabilities work out for us on a particular occasion. But over time, if the odds are in our favor and we place enough good bets, then skill should work, win out. And that's true in in Las Vegas as well. If you have an edge and you place enough bets and you don't, bet the farm, you don't bet too much so that you incur what's called risk of ruin, over time, you should win. That's how the house wins in Las Vegas. The mm-hmm. odds are in their side, on their side. You know, they play roulette. You got zero and double zero, you know, uh, and the roulette wheel. And over time, those odds will win for them. And so that's where the skill comes in, is placing enough good bets that the odds work out in your favor. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, thanks for that. Answer. I will say this just subjectively. I have worked with really top traders, and very, very often their winning percentage is not that much greater than 50%, but they're very good at limiting their losses and taking advantage of their winners. It's not that they win like 85% of the time. So I think that's relevant to this issue of luck versus skill. Mm. Part of the skill is recognizing when you're wrong and acting decisively. Mm. Yep. All right. Thanks, Brett. And thanks for the question, Matt. That was a good question. Um, So I just want to touch a little bit on lifestyle choices now uh, because you you gave the example of um, you, uh, you know, you're busy, you've got – you know, your consulting business and you've got kids or cats and, you know, the realisation that you didn't have to trade was uh, innovation, I guess, in itself. What about, uh, are there any other lifestyle um, things that we can do perhaps to, um, you know, juice up the creative side or the innovative side um, outside of trading that, you know, can impact our trading performance? Yeah, great question. What the research in positive psychology shows is that if we are in a positive mindset, we tend to be more productive, we tend to be more creative. And so what does that mean? To be in a positive mindset, it means to be energized physically, it means to be energized intellectually, it means to be connected to people that matter to us, it means having fun, doing things that make us happy, And it means doing things that are fulfilling, doing things that are special to us. And so many times what happens is that traders work on their training and work on their training. They stay in front of screens and they stay in front of screens and they burn out. Yeah. You want to have a life apart from trading that gives you energy, that gives you happiness, that gives you fulfillment, that connects you with people so that you are in the best mindset when you engage in trading. There are young traders who will uh, come to me and and some of them will apply for positions at trading firms and they'll tell me, I have a passion for trading. (laughs) 
<laughs> Training is my whole life. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you're fucked. <laughs> you <know? laughs> because if training is your whole life, your mood is going to rise and fall yeah. with your PL. Right. You know, part of your edge in trading is to have a full life apart from markets. And then you don't need each trade to work out. And it doesn't control your self esteem. And that allows you to sit back and only take the really good trades. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fantastic insight there. Um, now, I'm realize, I realize we're uh, coming up close to our time in about 10 minutes, but um, we've got some questions in the chat here, so we can jump over to a few yeah. of these questions and answer some of these to uh, finish up our chat for today. So uh, here's a question from Mark. Thanks for the question, Mark. I'll pop that one up on the screen. Fred, have you worked with many highly successful traders that use a completely mechanical approach to entries and exits? Yeah, good question, Mark. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I work with quant teams and, and obviously an algorithmic or quantitative approach to trading uh, does automate the entries and exits. And so all of that is back tested and optimized. Um, and there are some, um, you know, really good mathematical tools, uh, machine learning being one of them. Uh, if you check out a website called quantresearch.info, that is from a quantitative finance expert named Marcos Lopez de Prado, who's also written a book on machine learning. And for those of you who are system traders, who are quantitative, who are looking to automate your trading. There are some phenomenal resources at quantresearch.info. That's all one word, quantresearch.info. Uh, so yes, absolutely. In my case, and many of the hedge fund folks I work with, they are what are called hybrid traders. So you are using a back-tested edge, but then trading that uh, in a discretionary manner. So I don't take a historical signal automatically. I need to see price behavior confirming that signal, and then I'll take the trade. That's called a hybrid approach, and that's become increasingly common in the hedge fund world. Okay, thank you, Brett. A good question, Mark. Okay, here's one from Mohammed. Can mindfulness, sorry, can, mind, can mindfulness meditation have any effects on trading and trading psychology? Yeah, a good question, Mohammed. And, and you know what, what meditation does is it makes us mindful. It makes us self-aware. And so when we are self-aware, we can stand apart from our actions. We stand apart from our feelings. And that gives us more control over what we do. So mindfulness meditation is a very useful tool. Many traders I work with use an app called Headspace. You might be familiar with yeah. that, Andrew. Yeah. Um, but the Headspace app literally teaches you meditation. And then they will use meditation before they start trading to be in a focused mindset. They will use meditation during breaks during trading, maybe midday, in order to stay focused. And that can be very, very helpful to traders. Yep. Thank you very much, Brett. Here's a question from Sunny Badger. Love the name, Sunny Badger. That's great. Uh, this came up a, a little while ago. I think it was when you were talking about um, the market. You were looking at the um, number of stocks that were above the 50%. RSI. So yep. I think that's when this question came up. Why not back test during the last bear markets? Don't you think we'll face another bear market in the future? Isn't it better to be real to be realistic than optimistic with your trading strategy? <laughs> that's a you great question. Funny. I love yep. it. <laughs> Why well, be optimistic? The reason I'm being optimistic is that we're in a bull market. <laughs> the fucking things be going up and up and up. Yeah. You know, all we know is the past. You know, and, and 
I am extrapolating from the recent past into the immediate future. Now, is that a guaranteed edge? Of course not. And that's why I do take that hybrid approach and need to see uh, price action confirm the idea. But Andrew, I can't tell you how many traders recently have been losing money in the stock market because they say, it's gone up, it's got to come down, it's got to come down, it's overbought, it's overbought. They, they do that with the meme stocks, you know? <laughs> it's gone up so much, it has to come down. What? What? <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't think it makes sense to back test ideas from market conditions that are radically different from the ones that we have been experiencing. There are people who disagree with me. There are intelligent people who disagree with me. I am simply looking for the most recent regime and saying, I believe the immediate future will reflect what we have seen in the most recent regime. I don't need a market with a VIX of 45 to help me predict a market that has a VIX of 16. It's not relevant in my view. And I do get it that people want to find patterns that exist throughout history. Personally, I don't think they exist. I think that patterns in markets occur within particular regimes. And I'm looking to test the most recent regime to give me some clue about what might happen in the immediate future. So it's a great question that, that Sonny's asking. Um, and, and it is a bone of contention among those in the quant world. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. Here's one from SVs uh, on what you should focus on when trading. So let me put this one on the screen. Thank you, SV. Is a focus on things like specific percentage gain every month productive, or is it better to focus on not losing more um, by a certain amount? Yeah, I'm glad you've asked that question, SV. Yeah, it's best to focus on process. You know, some markets you'll make more money, some markets you'll make less money. I, I definitely would not focus on this. I can talk here. Specific percentage <laughs> gain every month. <laughs> you can tell it's getting late by time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, would, I, would not, I would not focus on a specific percentage gain each month because market conditions may not be conducive to that. Are we placing good trades? Good trades mean trades that follow rules that we have developed based on what I call our best practices. I wrote a book called Trading Psychology 2.0. And in that book, I talk about how we can identify our best practices as traders. In the medical world, best practices mean the things we do to get the best outcomes when we do surgeries or when we treat medical problems. You know, we do outcome research and we find out what works best. We can do that with our trading. We want to stick with our best practices. That's good process. Mm. And over time, that will be profitable. But in some market conditions, it'll be more profitable than others. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I realize we're right at our time here that I promised, but do you mind if we squeeze in one more question? Because... Um, oh, twist my arm. One more question. <laughs> there is a reason. There is a reason oh, okay, for this okay. one. There's a reason for this one. And it's from um, okay. from Suli. But first, I want to share something Suli said very early on in our discussion, which I think you're going to like. Um, okay, good. So, <laughs> Suli said, I don't have any questions. Well, that's changed because Suli has a question now. But I do want to show oh, okay. my yeah. I do want to show my regards to Brett. His material has helped me a lot over the years, and I want to thank him. So um, I, I just wanted to share that. that. Actually, now, I appreciate Suli's that a whole lot. Yeah, sure. Yep. You know, I, I don't market myself to traders. I don't work with individual traders. I don't, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't market myself at all. My work is limited to 
uh, institutions. And so what I put out there on the blog, what I put out there in my three minute uh, videos, you know, is really my way of giving back to a trading world that's been very good to me. Yeah. But it sounds like Suli does have a question. Suli does so have a question. So let's get to Suli's question and and then we'll wrap it up for today. So here we go up on the screen for Suli. What quality would you say is the most most shared amongst the most successful traders? Profitability. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) 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 That's tautological. (laughs) I had to say, anyway, uh, what quality is most shared amongst the most successful traders? I, I'll, I'll answer with two responses. One is what we just talked about, a process orientation. They're looking to do, th- they are rules-based. They, they trade according to rules. They, they trade uh, according to what works for them. They're not looking to trade. They're looking to be successful. And and so that process orientation I see among successful traders. And then the the final answer really gets at our theme of today's session, Andrew. And that is, I see uniqueness. I see creativity. Uh, You know, I see innovation among the most successful traders. When I see a trader doing something unique, looking at markets, unique markets, looking at markets in unique ways, uh, that tells me they're playing a different game and they have an opportunity to be uniquely successful. And, and so some element, it's just like looking at an entrepreneur. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, is your business unique? Are you doing something different than the competition? That's what tells us that there might be some real promise there. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. And that's a, a good question to uh, wrap up today. So um, for, for people who want to learn more from you or, you know, get in touch with you, how do they do that? Okay. So my um, email address is on my blog site. The blog site is right there in uh, <laughs> on what you post on the again. screen. Trader feed, it's all one word, T-R-A-D-E-R-F-E-E-D, traderfeed.blogspot.com. And on that blog site, you'll you'll see my email address, but also you'll see a link to a free blog book. It's a book that's been written on a blog platform, so it's free to download, on the spirituality of trading. That's a really interesting topic that people have not talked about. And the the theme, it's called Radical Renewal. The theme of that book is that great trading comes from the soul, not the ego. And that's really what spirituality is all about. Getting past our egos and trading or operating from the soul. And uh, in that blog book, I talk about how we can get past the distortions of the ego to be able to access our soulful qualities. So um, listeners may be interested in that topic. And, And of course, on the blog, I tackle various topics in trading psychology and trading and Hopefully, that'll be a resource. I also link my three-minute trading coach videos. So they're short videos on trading psychology-related topics. So there's a bunch of information there, and it's all free. <laughs> so, and, and you know what? You don't even have to give your email address. You know how it, it, a lot of websites, you have to give your email yeah. address, and then you get targeted with all sorts of marketing and all that shit. Yeah. No, no, I don't do any of that. So anyway, it's free information and hopefully it's a resource to traders out there. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Brett. And um, we're getting a lot of uh, comments in the chat to say thanks. So perhaps uh, we'll just share a few to wrap up for today. And uh, I appreciate we've gone a few minutes over the time, I promise. So thank you for being so uh, gracious about about that with your time. Yeah, thank you. So, So Shiv says thanks. I guess Shiv was SV. 
the mystery has been uh-huh. resolved. Great. Ola, great. Ola's a regular. Great session. Thanks, Brett and Andrew. We'll do two more here. Matt said, thank you both. Great webinar and great question from Matt. And here's Suli. Let's end with Suli. Thanks again, Brett, and thanks, Andrew. Much respect for uh, giving yeah, us your that, time. So. All the, those uh, really, uh, really appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, did you filter out the comments that said he's a total idiot? <laughs> Why'd you bring him on the show? <laughs> no, it was all positive today. So it's um, all positive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, thanks again, Brad. I really do appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the yeah. audience for joining. And apologies we didn't get to all the questions, but uh, uh, maybe another time we'll have another chat in six years from now. Is it five or six years? Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah maybe even the last time. And by the way, we'll be moving into a new place uh, again. But okay. thank you so much, Andrew, for organizing this and uh, good luck in, in your work going forward. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And we'll catch you uh, another time. Cheers. Bye-bye.